So again, my name is Frank Fillmore. I'm a principal in the Fillmore Group. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Kim May. Hello. <laughs> Quite an introduction there, Kim. <laughs> oh, it's like when you're doing that. Oh, <laughs> that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is the second of three webinars that we're uh, that we're producing this summer um, that are all basically about um, some of the uh, hybridization of data um, data uses in databases today. And um, HTAP is a, is a term is a relatively new term, but basically it's it's the term for what it is. And this is what we're seeing customers that are using the um, IBM DB2 Analytics Accelerator, the IDAA, on the mainframe side, where you're seeing the uh, Natiza for analytics married with the DB2 for ZOS on the mainframe. And then you're also seeing on the distributed side, you're seeing IBM's proprietary DB2 Blue technology. So um, exciting times. Uh, every most of the customers that we run into these days um, tell us how hard they've worked over the past five to ten years, um, separating out their analytic workloads um, so that they don't um, degrade the performance of their transaction processing. And um, now with some um, some new technology and some new ways of doing things, we're seeing people actually able to reconsolidate those workloads. So it's really interest. It's an interesting topic and and a good thing to know, particularly at the same time that we are all being bombarded with messaging about Hadoop and how um, with Hadoop you're just sort of dumping everything together and oh my gosh it magically works. Um, anyone who's been in technology for more than six months usually knows that there is no magic. Um, so uh, this is um, a little bit of the 2015. Summer of 2015 update. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, Frank is the principal in the Fillmore Group. I work for the Fillmore Group. We are a premier IBM business partner. We have a DB2 education service. Uh, we do a lot of consulting and we also are an IBM information management product and solution reseller for both distributed and on the Z side. Uh, Frank is a DB2 Gold Consultant and an Information Champion. I am also an Information Champion. I always have to give a shout out to the Information Champion program. And um, um, I think that's pretty much it. You ready, Frank? I am. That was wonderful. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Great job. So we're ready to dive into the meat of the matter after that um, introduction. I appreci appreciate Kim uh, setting the stage and the framework for what we're about to discuss. Um, HTAP is a new term for me. Um, I had not heard it before January this year, and an IBM uh, fellow, uh, someone uh, named Namik Hurley, who you may know, uh, who has worked in IBM development, uh, currently uh, posted at the Boblingen Lab, uh, started talking about HTAP, Hybrid Transaction and Analytic Processing, HTAP. I uh, see it a lot of different ways. I see it with slashes. I see hybrid analytic, analytical, um, so different variations. So if you go to search on it, you may may or may not get ahead. It was a, a, a term originally coined by Gartner um, and, and about six months ago. And IBM is now, as Kim said, moving away from the model where um, analytic and transaction workloads need to be kept separate on separate platforms, maybe separate databases, um, and, and bringing those together for uh, transaction processing and real-time analytics. And we'll talk about why and we'll talk about how this is being accomplished. So to look at the, um, the way that the world works today, we have uh, a series of steps that we go through moving from left to right, uh, starting with OLTP, online transaction processing, and then we typically have some sort of ETL process that may move to a staging area or an ODS. We may move into an enterprise data warehouse and then have a series of data marts for our um, various departments. Um, so this is the way that a lot of companies do business. I've seen this template over and over again, and uh, there are lots of historical reasons. So one was the different access patterns. I access data differently to do analytics, maybe thousands or millions or billions of rows than I do uh, for transaction processing. So I may be accessing a dozen records for a recent automobile accident if I'm an insurance company. Um, the, uh, the enterprise data warehouse becomes the hub for analytics. So we have designated a new place to go when you want this, heavily um, optimized towards access patterns. So star schema data modeling, uh, a, a fact table with a series of dimension tables, which completely reformats the data from the, the, the standard uh, where it is stored for OLTP. 
um, different life cycle characteristics. So um, one of the big concerns is um, data retention for compliance and legal reasons now. Um, we don't necessarily want to keep seven years of data in our transaction processing system because it may slow down transaction processing, whereas uh, we may be legally required to keep data for an extended period of time. And uh, we would do that in the data warehouse rather than in the transaction processing system. And then finally, a lack of uh, service level agreements. Um, I know um, that I'm working with a number of customers today and we're doing replication projects and we're talking about latency and how soon does the data need to be there from the point it's committed at the transaction processing system until it appears in the data warehouse. And a lot of times you get, I don't know, as fast as possible, sub-second. Um, but no real understanding of what the business requirements are. Is the data that I'm looking at, do I really need to see it within microseconds of the transaction closing or um, is a longer period of time? Do I need to see that data married with other data from other systems? So these are all the historical reasons that we have this level of um, complexity. And that is one of the negative ramifications and probably the foremost. So um, one statistic that Kim has been uh, very focused on for the past six months, we heard this at an IBM presentation in January, is that 60%, I'm sorry, 25 to 40. Yeah, it depends on who you talk to, but 25 to 40, that's what IBM will cop, cop to. 25 to 40% of IT budgets are spent on moving data. So if you look at this drawing that we have here on the slide, all of these different platforms, all of the ETL software, all of the people necessary to manage all of these different environments, the, um, the replication software that you may need to move from platform to platform, all of that infrastructure cost um, is, is eating up IT budgets in order to get the data positioned so you can do the analytics that, that you need. So the HTAP, the hybrid transaction analytic processing approach is uh, I have a single application platform um, that uh, can access uh, via common interfaces a single database that uh, has all the data, data I need in the form with the retention policies that allows me to perform both transaction processing and near real-time analytics. So I can do things that are very difficult to do in the other environment. So if I page back for a second and I look at this, if, I, if my data takes two days or even an hour to get to the enterprise data warehouse, what are the opportunities that are lost? Well, I can't stop a transaction on flight that, in flight that may be fraudulent. I can't help a customer decide at the point of sale if they would like to purchase other products. So um, the fact that we have this latency, uh, even, a, even of an hour, even of a couple of minutes, means that we are losing business opportunities. If my transaction processing and my analytics both reside in the same platform, I can now perform um, business services for my customers in ways that I could not do that before. The other benefits are I now have uniform policies and procedures for security, for high availability, for disaster recovery. Again, going back to the first slide, each of these different platforms needs to have its own DR site, its own failover um, policies, it, the software that manages that and so forth. So not only is this very complex, but we can't say to people, well, the enterprise data warehouse is going to be down for two days because we're doing a hardware upgrade. We need to have um, uh, high availability, uh, whether for planned or unplanned outages. Um, we also have the uh, efficient movement of data within the system, often that does not involve complex ETL, something like Informatica or Data Stage from IBM. Um, and the opportunity to remove or consolidate some layers of data, leading to a, a single database image, if not a single database in practice. So to look at um, one, one aspect of this, the ability to catch a, um, uh, a transaction in flight to ensure that it does not complete if it is not uh, a, a legitimate transaction. Um, so this is an example of a customer that would identify fraudulent transactions post payment um, and then would try to recover the money that was extended to a customer or to a vendor that should not have been vended and, and to try to recoup that, try to claw that back. 
And so you can see the amount of cost that was associated with that. So the, the cost of collection per claim, the difference between trying to undo or reverse a transaction as opposed to stopping it in flight, which is what appears on the right-hand side. The success rate of 50% as opposed to the 90% of stopping fraudulent transactions. And you can see, I don't want to step you through the whole chart, but the bottom line is that by using predictive analytics to identify transactions that should not be completed, this particular customer was saving uh, $150,000 per day uh, or $56 million per year. So a huge amount of money by using predictive analytics on transactions in flight on near real time OLTP data. Um, re eliminating the ETL reduces the IT expense. So now we have, we have shown that there are ways that we can reduce our operational expense of not paying out money that should not be paid out and then try to get that back. Uh, reducing the IT expense, which spent in the environment within the infrastructure to move data, to transform data, to put it in a form that can be consumed by analytic applications. Um, we see um, a lot of costs associated with this, so multiple copies of the data, so lots of redundancy, potential inconsistency, um, just uh, disk storage of uh, terabytes and terabytes of data. Uh, significant compute power um, and transactions and analytics uh, isolation, meaning that the latency or the time that it takes to actually move the data may impact my ability to do um, um, transformative types of analytics within the organization. So an example of one terabyte ETL per day, again, this is an IBM study, um, the initial copy plus three derivatives in the data marts in the enterprise data warehouse and the ODS um, could cost $8 million over four years. So again, a huge expense if you could eliminate the IT, uh, the, the IT expense of performing the ETL to move the data where the analytics are being performed uh, could be huge. Kim. Yeah, and I think this is this is one of the things that we discussed a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, some of the other costs that are associated with this, you know, don't show up when you see this sort of chart. And and the data governance um, is is a huge expense, and and it's not something that's necessarily going to show up on paper. But if you've got um, if you make four copies of of your data. Each of those copies is going to be subject to the same governance guidelines as the original or in most organizations. And so you've got all that cost as well. And then, of course, the data retention and all that kind of stuff that you're that that you're obligated to do for the original. So when you when you start talking about this, you start to realize just how, you know, when we keep hearing about this explosion of data and the, the volume and the velocity and all this kind of stuff with data, some of this is, is self-inflicted. Um, and one of the things that we're, you know, hoping to see customers recognize over the next couple of years is that if you're starting, if you're making five or six or ten copies of your data, then you're creating your own data explosion. And if you can, if you can control that a little bit um, just by pulling stuff back and not copying it, then the savings that we're seeing here, when you see these eight million dollar type numbers, these these aren't unrealistic. Thank you, Kim. And I actually backed up to the, the, the first slide in the, the core of the presentation and the other, the other point that I wanted to make in terms of uh, data breaches. And uh, when you talk about data governance, I mean, you have more doors, more gates, more windows into your data. Um, you are multiplying the potential that someone is going to find a vulnerability and be able to exploit it. So moving forward in the presentation. So the HTAP. Uh, hybrid transaction analytic processing. Um, the benefits are, as we said before, uh, uniform procedures for security, HADR, et cetera, reduced cost, uniform access for any types of data for any types of applications, and consolidating some of the layers, ultimately leading to the single database image. So there are a lot of different approaches to this. Um, the um, Lots of RAM, uh, so in-memory databases, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, massively parallel processing, so large numbers of sockets and cores and servers, which could be very expensive. Um, hardware acceleration through special purpose processors, which we're going to talk about a lot more. Um, the FPGA, uh, Field Programmable Gate Array. And then columnar data stores, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, and using appliances. 
So the challenges that we have uh, are some of the challenges that have exhibited in themselves have been met. So if you look on the screen and you see the, uh, the check marks on the right-hand side under challenges, mixed workload management capabilities. The, the, the challenge has always been to ensure that OLTP was not impacted by uh, analytic processing. And we think we have that one solved and we'll see how. Uh, ensuring continuous availability, security, reliability, we think we have that solved. Uh, providing seamless scale up and scale out. So as I add more data, as I add more users, as I add more transaction processing, as I add more analytics, can I do that? Um, and so the, uh, the, the last piece is providing universal processing capabilities uh, to deliver the best performance for both, both transactional and analytic workloads without the need for excessive tuning. So um, do we need to go through the ETL uh, process? Do we need to reform our data using a star schema? Do we need to develop specialized indexes? So the, the jury's still out on that. So finally, IBM has delivered HTAP in two different ways. So I don't have a, a sense, I should have put together a poll of the types of platforms on which folks are currently working. Uh, but IBM has approached uh, this challenge two different ways on two different platforms. So IBM has used uh, on their DB2 for ZOS the approach of what we call heterogeneous scale-out um, using an appliance or the FPGA processing that is available in Netiza for the IBM DB2 Analytics Accelerator. The way that they've achieved this same approach, uh, the ability to mix workloads, is uh, on the DB2 for Z Linux or Linux Unix Windows platforms is uh, blue acceleration. So those are the two different ways that HTAP is being delivered uh, on those two different database servers. And we'll, we'll look at each of those in detail. Uh, at this point, I'd like to pause and see if there are any questions. Uh, you can use the chat facility that is available. You can type in a question, or you can go ahead and raise your hand. I don't want to zip through this too quickly. Uh, see if there are any. We have about 20 folks uh, online right now. If there's anything that's just gnawing at you that you need to uh, ask about, please let me know. And we'll have an opportunity. What I'll do is at the end of the uh, the webinar, I'll open the uh, the microphones and and let people ask questions in a conversational fashion. Okay, I'm going to keep rolling. So, the IBM DB2 Analytics Accelerator (IDAA) provides both OLTP and Natiza Analytics. Uh, in the same platform image. And I, I'm very specific about that because the way IDAA works, if you're not familiar with it, it combines uh, a Netiza accelerator via a private uh, 10 uh, megabit per second network with DB2 for ZOS so that all of my transaction processing, all my transactional analytics, meaning analytics that I perform as I'm in the scope of a transaction, for example, whether or not I let a transaction pass through to payment or I honor a credit card charge at the point of sale, as well as complex analytics. So I do deep dive analytics for actuarial purposes, for rating insurance policies and those types of things. Notice that all of those things that I just mentioned, the OLTP, transactional analytics, and the complex analytics all enter through the DB2 for ZOS system. So if you have a DB2 for ZOS platform, all of the high availability, all of the backup recovery, all of the DR uh, will all be managed in the same way that you do for DB2 for ZOS today, uh, with uh, one minor exception, and we'll see that later on. So the Analytics Accelerator, how is it different? Um, orders of magnitude, faster performance on query workloads, uh, up to two or 3,000 times as fast, stuff that used to run in hours or not run at all, would get killed by uh, your resource limit facility. Um, uh, thresholds uh, is allowed to run through completion because it completes in seconds. Uh, deep integration with DB2 for ZOS, uh, 10 and 11. Self-managed workloads, meaning that it is the DB2 for ZOS optimizer itself, which will determine where a particular query will run. Will it run natively in DB2 for ZOS, or will it be vended off to the Netiza appliance? Uh, transparency is delivered because applications connected to DB2 are completely unaware of the accelerator 
in the background. It is um, what I like to refer to as a specialty engine, uh, like a Zip or a Zap on the ZOS platform, the System Z platform, um, that allows you to uh, offload work from general purpose processors. In this case, you're offloading it to a completely different appliance with its own CPU, with its own memory, um, and uh, with its own disk storage. So we can see uh, these are some statistics from the rollout uh, for the IDAA. So the very first model known as TwinFin, uh, the N1000, uh, you can see Query 1 in the top of the chart. Uh, running natively on DB2 for ZOS, it ran in 2 hours and 39 minutes. Um, in, with the IDAA, it ran in 5 seconds for almost 2,000 times uh, performance improvement. So, why do you care? Why do we need an HTAP? Um, if we haven't described it to you in sufficient detail so far, uh, business critical analytic applications demand low latency. So I don't have the benefit of waiting an hour or a day to get the data to a place in a form that I can analyze it. Um, the issue is the spreading uh, the analytic components across multiple platforms uh, increases the latency, which we don't want, it also increases the cost and complexity and governance risks. So the cost we talked about, all those copies of data on all those different servers cost money. The complexity is all those different moving pieces for your, your ETL jobs that need to run on a regular basis. And then finally, the governance risk, both um, applying the same policies to your data throughout the enterprise and the risk that you could be victim of a, of a breach. So by keeping the analytic components closer to the source data, it improves all those things. The data governance uh, is what you would apply to uh, the same policies um, and the same enforcement mechanisms would be applied to analytic users as well as the OLTP users. So the same care with which you determine who can actually enter a transaction or what applications can enter transactions can now be used to govern who can, who can see the data and uh, be able to organize it. So some use cases uh, from the IDAA world. Um, a large Brazilian bank uh, is delivering IT at the speed of business by eliminating uh, reporting latency. So they had an ETL process um, that took 24 hours with 11 more hours for reporting. So 35 hours end to end, noting that there are only 24 hours in a day. This could lead to some daily reporting problems. Uh, now takes an hour and 26 seconds. So still don't have real-time analytics, but now have gotten into a much more uh, manageable window. Uh, talked to another customer who wanted to analyze uh, System Z performance data um, using um, um, SAS and SyncSort, and um, they were analyzing SMF data and Omegamon data, and they were moving it from one DB2 for ZOS subsystem to another so they wouldn't impact production, and it was taking about 11 hours a night. So this is something that could uh, greatly reduce uh, the latency access to the data and the CPU cycles that you're spending to get the data where you want it. So a, uh, the other, this is the, uh, the, the European convenience store. Um, the European convenience store chain is doing something that they could never do before, which is engage the customer at the point of sale uh, through the reduced analytic response time. So if I can run a query in seconds and say, given the collection of purchases that this customer has made, what are customers also likely to purchase? Uh, I could have my point of sale clerk or a display say, have you also considered these other purchases that would, would go well? If you bought chips, would you like to also buy dip? Is a very simple example, but you may have much more complex uh, market basket combinations, and if you can do that in seconds and not hold the customer up, now you have another method of customer engagement. This particular uh, European convenience store increased sales by 5% um, through reduced analytic response time. So they were 99.8% um, faster on the OLTP content. Uh, content. And then finally, um, is disk storage. Disk storage is sort of forgotten, and we've, we've um, uh, talked to a number of customers. We have one customer that charges internally in their chargeback system on System Z um, $30 per gigabyte per month. 
uh, for disk storage. So when you run into the multiple terabytes of data, you're talking about an enormous internal expense. So if we have, A, um, not so many copies of the data, and B, we have um, cheaper disk storage on which to position that data, wouldn't it make sense to do so rather than expensive System Z spinning disk? So um, the applications, and, and Kim, you actually did an analysis of the IDA, and you were looking at what, less than a dollar per gigabyte? Per month. Per month, that's what it was. It was less than a dollar per gigabyte per month. So this, uh, the, the, the first customer that I told you about for their internal chargeback systems could save $29 per gigabyte per month. So what the... what the could make $29 per gigabyte per month. Or they could make $20. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They, they don't have to... They don't have to lower their chargeback and they could become a profit center. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. I understand. Thank you. So um, the way that the IDA works is um, we have the existing DB2 for ZOS that you may know and love. And please understand, if you're coming to this and you say, I don't know why he's talking about DB2 for ZOS, I have DB2 for Linux, Unix, Windows. Um, we're going to talk about that in a second, but we're, go we're going to break that in pieces because... Um, we have two different approaches to achieve the same end goal, depending on what platform you're currently working. So the DB2 for ZOS uses what I called before heterogeneous scale out. I am moving here to the right of the screen. I am moving an IBM DB2 analytics accelerator built on the TESA technology into the same infrastructure with a 10 megabit per second private network connected to DB2 for ZOS, all of my applications, all of my backup recovery, all of my security, all of the tools, all of my commands, all of my utilities will all continue to operate on DB2 for ZOS that I know and love. So I don't need to change my applications. I don't need to have a bunch of my staff members now become experts in Natiza, another operating system and another method of doing business. All of that is transparently handled behind the scenes through the IDAA pairing. So how does it work? Uh, access to data in terms of authorization and privileges, as I mentioned before, is controlled by DB2 for ZOS. Logging, updates, fast single record lookup. So if I say I want uh, select star from patient where patient ID equals one, two, three, four, five. That's still going to be vended from DB2 for ZOS the way that it always has. DB2 for ZOS does the backup and recovery and remains the system of record. So there is no external communication to the Natiza platform. I can't tap into it. It's not allowed. It's not one of the design points. So we can look at the way that the uh, optimizer will tr treat a query. Um, the optimizer uh, we'll receive the request for the application, and we're assuming that we're using dynamic SQL, although IDA supports static SQL. We're looking at this at runtime as opposed to at bind time. But the blue line shows a query that's received by DB2 for ZOS through whatever application interface you're using. It gets evaluated by the optimizer and determines that this is a query that could best be handled by DB2 for ZOS natively, the single um, single row lookup on a unique index or something like that. So the query will be routed back through the application interface to the application, the result set, <clears throat> with, uh, in the way that it always would have, no change. On the other hand, uh, I have the red line that goes to the optimizer, and the optimizer determines that this is a query that could benefit from acceleration. It sends it to the IDAA DRDA requester. So in this instance, uh, DB2 for ZOS becomes a DRDA, Distributed Relational Database Architecture, application requester. So if you have applications today that may run on DB, one DB2 for ZOS subsystem and you are connecting to a different remote DB2 for ZOS subsystem, this is working exactly the same way. The query will be vended to an SMP host on the Natiza. It will then be distributed to snippet processor units, each of which within the Natiza has their own CPU, their own field programmable gate array, their own memory, and all of their own disk drives. The data is striped. There's not a single point of failure. So I don't have to worry about something going down within the Natiza box itself. 
once the answer set is completed, the SMP host um, is uh, delivered back through the red line, back to the application interface, to the application. The application is unaware that it made this trip over to this foreign box and comes back um, for um, su supplying the application with what was requested. So the only thing that's dead. The only thing that's kind of weird on this slide, if you look at it, is that if you look at it visually, um, if you look at the blue line on your slide, Frank, um, your, your blue line looks much shorter, whereas your red line looks like it's going all over the place. But if you actually time these, it's always amazing to see the timing um, when something ends up going to the accelerator is usually just amazingly fast. So I guess that's why the, the red means red hot, super fast, <laughs> and, and the blue means slow is a no. no, no, it doesn't mean <laughs> slow. And it's not necessarily slow. It's just it doesn't belong. The data is not in the accelerator. It's not going to work in the accelerator. Well, the data yeah. may not be in the accelerator. That would be one reason yeah. for the blue line is that not all of the data in DB2 for ZOS needs to be in the accelerator. And so if it's not, the optimizer will say, I can't accelerate it because the data is not available. Um, but in, in this case, there is some overhead. There's, there's Milton Friedman told us there's no such thing as the free, free lunch, and um, lot, lots of other economists have told us that. Um, but the, the bottom line is that there is some overhead from making this hop over to the other box. But if I'm running my query 2,000 times faster, the little bit of overhead associated with going to the other box through the private network is lost. We don't, we don't even worry about it. Um, so uh, we get... Uh, uh, we get much greater speed. So I had a uh, a question. I thought I did. I may have to come back to the question. I, I had it open, then I closed it so you could see the screen. So I have to go back to that again. So at a greater level of detail, how does the Natiza run query so fast? So basically what I'm doing is I am processing data at the speed with which it is read from disk. So instead of taking my data off of disk and moving it into a buffer pool in memory in pages. So if you think about it, I may have only one row on a DB2 for ZOS page that is of interest to me. Has the right state code, has the right last name, has the right uh, purchase, purchase coding, whatever it is that interests me about this row, they may be scattered throughout my pages because my data may be clustered on something else um, based on when the transaction was performed. So instead of taking all of those pages of data, moving them off of disk and into the buffer pool, the way that the, um, the IDAA works is it takes the query and pushes it down to the FPGA core, the field programmable gate array, the FPGA, and as the data is scanned off of disk, applies the different pieces of the SQL statement. So for example, the first thing it'll do is decompress the data. We usually get about four by data compression on the IDAA. It then will project the data based on what um, uh, columns are requested in the select clause. So the state, the age, the gender, uh, would be projected here. So I am, I am eliminating data that I'm not interested in as soon as it comes off of disk. Then I would go to the restrict phase, still within the FPGA core, and I would apply the where clause predicate. So in this case, state is Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. And then any um, aggregations, any other advanced analytics could be applied in the CPU core, CPU core associated with the FPGA. Uh, such as uh, um, group by state and age. So all of this, instead of moving the data to the analytics, I'm moving the analytics to the data. I'm taking the query itself and moving it to where it's stored on disk, and that's one of the ways that we can get the orders of magnitude improvement. So just so you have an idea what these boxes look like, uh, I have the N3000 model, the Mako, which is the most currently available, the N2000, which is still being vended. Um, and we can, the, the, this is an appliance. It's sold as a unit. So the hardware, the storage, the CPU cores, the FPGAs, uh, this is not the old Dell where you could just say how much memory you wanted and how much disk you wanted. These come in configurations starting more or less with the 002 model, which is the quarter rack, and then move up to a half rack and a full rack. And basically, what you're getting is more concurrency, more uh, different connected users, and more disk storage. 
So the quarter rack will allow you to store uh, up to uh, 32 terabytes, assuming four by compression of data. Now, in a lot of DB2 for ZOS shops, data that's stored in DB2 currently, maybe not in ISAM, uh, par pardon me, IMS, and, and maybe not in um, uh, VSAM, but certainly uh, in DB2 for ZOS, 32 terabytes is a lot of data. Um, we, we usually, the, a lot of the folks, long-standing DB2 for ZOS shops, four, six, 10 terabytes of data. So even the low end of the uh, Natiza configurations for IDA would be able to satisfy those requirements. The other aspect to keep in mind of the way that the IDA is configured is something called the high performance storage saver. One of the design points is uh, available in version four of IDAA is that the data does not need to reside in DB2 for ZOS. It can uh, only reside in the, uh, the Natiza box. So uh, as I mentioned earlier in the discussion, I may want to keep transactional data for 60 or 90 days on my system of record. If I'm an insurance company, most claims close within 90 days and then they can be stored for historical legal compliance purposes. So you could do the same thing with uh, the IDAA. You could say, I want to keep only the most current 90 days of data in my transaction processing system and automatically move over and only store in the IDAA um, the historical and archival data. So it saves DB2 for ZOS spinning disk costs. Um, again, we said that the HPSS uh, would cost under a dollar per gigabyte. It was roughly 60 to, per, per month, roughly 60 to 70, per, uh, 60 or 70 cents. Now, one of the questions that comes up all the time is, how do I keep my data current? If I want to do near real-time analytics, how do I do this? Well, one is I could do full table refreshes. This was the only way that was supported when IDA was first announced. Um, but that becomes impractical. If I have billion row tables and only a very small percentage of that data changes on a daily basis, it doesn't make sense for me to be moving billions of rows over to the IDA each night. I'm losing some of the benefit by burning the data movement costs, whether it's CPU or I.O. Um, one other possibility is the refresh of a partition of data. So if my data is partitioned by time and I keep... 13 rolling months on DB2 for ZOS, only the current month would need to be updated on the IDA on a daily basis. Uh, so we're in the last day of June, I would only have to move June over every day, every hour, or on whatever time sequence I wanted to. Um, but um, uh, all of the other months, July of 2014 through um, 2000, um, um, May of 2015 would be static, and I wouldn't have to move them again. And finally, there is a capability of what is called incremental update. So this is a, an IBM change data capture agent that reads the data as it appears on the DB2 for ZOS logs and moves the data uh, as the changes, inserts, updates, and deletes are occurring over to the IDA generally within a minute. So my data is consistent uh, within a minute of when the transaction commit occurs on the system of record. Now, for some applications, that minute doesn't matter. Uh, if I'm the European convenience store, um, I don't need to do my market basket analysis on what people have bought within the last minute. I want to determine what they bought in the last three months and see whether, you know, if they purchase product X and then they go with purchase you know, they also typically purchase Y, that's going to be a pattern of data that establishes itself over time. So it would depend on your business requirements for how closely the data needs to be aligned in time. So the value proposition, um, single platform, single API for OLTP and analytics, reducing ZOS CPU utilization, uh, analytics latency, complexity risk, the integration costs of having all those different pieces and platforms that need to be managed, and the storage costs for archival and historical data, I get an increase in RAS, uh, reliability, availability, and serviceability. I mentioned before um, that there, there is uh, one exception in terms of how I manage high availability, and that is the deployment options. I can have a many to many relationship between DB2 for ZOS subsystems 
and the Natiza boxes that are vending them. And one of the most common configurations I could have would be seen at the bottom where I have two distinct DB2 for ZOS subsystems, each accessing uh, different Natiza platforms. So I don't have any single points of failure. So if necessary, I could do rolling upgrades both to the Natiza box and to the DB2 for ZOS subsystems, whether it's DB2 for ZOS version 10 to 11 or the newest version of the Natiza platform or the newest version of IDAA. Uh, I could do that in a, in a, in a fashion that does not um, um, make an, uh, an, an outage occur. Uh, the other thing that I could do with these deployment options is, I, is load balancing. So in the same way that I can, within parallel sysplex, load balance between um, members in that environment, in a data sharing group, I can do the same thing with the accelerators. So the accelerators would actually return back to the data sharing group a capacity or weight that uh, determines how busy that individual accelerator is, and then have subsequent queries be sent down to the uh, accelerators based on which one is least busy. So this is the same way that your applications are directed to the member of the data sharing group, uh, which is least, least busy uh, in that environment. Okay, I'm going to pause here again uh, to see if there are any questions, any raised hands. Uh, let me look at my attendees. Do, do, do. And I'm not seeing any, but we have, we're going to change gears here for a second. We're going to move from the focus on the way that HTAP is implemented on the Z platform and look at the way that HTAP is implemented on the Linux Unix Windows platform. So if, any, if there are no questions right now about uh, the uh, Z platform, wait a minute, I do have a question. Hang on for a second. Let me see, what is the future of HTAP infrastructure for DB2 for ZOS? And so the future is um, the, the, the future is to try to reduce the latency. Um, instead of having to move the data to the point where I have the min one minute latency is to reduce that so that within the same, if not within the same commit scope, very, very soon after that in an asynchronous fashion, one would be um, updated over the other. Um, this is IBM, the, the HTAP uh, deploying the IBM DB2 Analytics Accelerator uh, is, is IBM's direction for the foreseeable future. IBM has been very successful with IDAA. Uh, it started out as something called the Smart Analytics Optimizer, um, of which very few were sold. IBM has sold well into the hundreds of the, of the IDAAs to customers, um, and they're doubling that year over year. So there is uh, quite a bit of uptake. So um, this infrastructure of marrying the Natiza to DB2 for ZOS to create the IDA is the future and the only uh, challenges would be to remove that um, uh, latency bogey and, and shrink it further. So if it didn't answer your question, please um, post a clarification. Otherwise, I am going to go ahead with uh, the blue acceleration. And I'm just going to mi minimize that. That's what I did before I shut it. So there we go. Um, so I had promised you earlier, I don't have as many slides on Blue Acceleration, but I have a few. Um, so this is for customers that are using DB2 for Linux, Unix, Windows, and deploying DB2 on those platforms. So how can we get the same benefits of HTAP? The near real-time analytics, uh, the, the single database image, uh, the reduction of the latency uh, reduction of the complexity risks and so forth. And that is done through uh, DB2 10.5 Blue Acceleration, which was announced, what, two years ago? 2013? I'm looking at Kim and I'm getting shrugged shoulders. <laughs> yeah, so it w I recall April of 2013. So a fairly mature technology at this point. Um, Blue Acceleration is a memory optimized database. It is not an in-memory database, although it functions best. Um, when as much of the data as possible is located in memory. Um, there, um, Blue Acceleration uses what it calls actionable compression so that the data can be used without decompressing. Um, so I reduce some of the overhead. Uh, I am storing the data in a columnar fashion. So if I go back to my example before of reading a page of, of data, a 4K, 8K, 16, or 32K page, 
of data into a buffer pool in memory where only one row might be of interest and that one row may take up 100 or 200 bytes, um, I am now able to focus only on the columns uh, of data that are of interest to me. So let's say I'm doing analytics and I want to know based on time of purchase and location and uh, the spe specific SKU that was purchased, what the correlation is between those, what products are bought more frequently over the time of day. So I'm only looking at three pieces of data. In the transaction that supports the point of sale system, I may have 15 or 20 pieces of data. So if you look in the lower right hand corner of the storage, notice that the data is stored uh, for columnar tables using the compressed encoded columnar format. So in this case, column four is the only one that's stored. They all have their own buffers. They're all stored separately. So now I'm able to keep the data separate and only focus on the data that is of interest without managing or moving a whole lot of data that is not of interest. Uh, the other thing that the Blue Acceleration does is something called a SIMD or single instruction multiple data. This exploits processor technology that is available from vendors. This is a hardware feature that is exploited by DB2 Acceleration, uh, DB2 Blue Acceleration, which allows you to, uh, through a single execution of an instruction, process multiple pieces of data at the same time. So Blue Acceleration is a hybrid, uh, so hence the H and H tap that supports mixed workloads of both OLTP and analytic um, uh, requirements. So let me go back for a second. I, wanna, I want to, um, to discuss this in a little bit more detail. The IDAA took advantage of um, what we called heterogeneous scale out, of adding a different distinct platform for the analytics. That's not the approach with DB2 with Blue Acceleration. Here, I have a single database image. All of this data is stored, both the classic row tables, as well as the compressed encoded columnar tables are stored within the same database image. So I would have um, uh, classic DB2 buffer pools. I would have all of the same runtime APIs that I would have with DB2 for ZOS, and at the same time within the same database. So in some ways, this is very heretical because we're saying that we're mixing on the same platform in the same database, the analytics and the uh, OLTP workloads. The way that that is managed so that my OLTP doesn't suffer from the um, query from hell is using WLM or workload manager to be able to favor certain workloads over others so that I don't have analytic queries interfering with my ability to process transactions at the same time. So this is using the techniques of columnar encoding and in-memory techniques uh, instead of the heterogeneous scale-out that uh, IDAA uses. Um, there are, um, I can set the DB2 workload registry variable to enable analytics uh, to be performed in the database. Uh, I would um, uh, use, I can have column organ, organized table, um, which would be the default uh, uh, table type if I wanted an, an analytic workload uh, only database or primarily um, I would actually leave this setting off if I wanted to process OLTP and analytic workloads in the same database and I can use something that we're going to see in a second called shadow tables. Um, the default page size uh, if I set the DB2 workload registry variable would be 32 kilobytes and the extent size of 4 for massive movement of data um, so I could process lots of data within a column or columns very quickly. So here are the shadow tables that I had mentioned. I can have the same, tata, the same table represented twice within the same data store in two different formats. I can have my traditional row store, name, address, phone, number, city, state, zip, my transaction processing record, um, stored in OLTP format in the database. In the same database, in the same DB2 instance, I can have a copy of that data stored in a column store format using a specialized version of materialized query tables or MQTs. 
a shadow table is implemented using the MQT um, 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 syntax. And then finally, in order to keep my data in sync, our friend Change Data Capture, the CDC, will replicate uh, from the transaction log in DB2 for LUW as the inserts, updates, and deletes occur over to the column store uh, uh, version of the table. In the same way that we saw for the HTAP, for the IDAA on Z, the optimizer can make the call at uh, optimization, at query optimization time, both for static and dynamic SQL, as to whether I want to run a particular query against the OLTP row version of the data, or instead, based on the query characteristics, do I want to vend that to the shadow table so that I could do my analytic workloads against the columnar version of the table. So much the same design point, but implemented in two very different fashions. So I want to pause there and see if there are any questions about HTAP on the DB2 for Linux Unix Windows platform. I see a raised hand. And that would be uh, Sushanta Dash. Um, I am not able to open your microphone. It says that you're accessing this through the web. So if you could use the chat facility to type in your question, uh, I would be able to answer it that way. And let me see anyone else. Any raised hands? So I'm going to go ahead with the wrap up as uh, uh, Sushana, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, is um, posting her question. But we're just about at the top of the hour. Uh, the next steps um, are um, you can determine whether the HTAP that is most appropriate for your environment, the HTAP IDAA for Z environments, or the HTAP uh, DB2 for for with Blue Acceleration for LUW environments, um, the Fillmore Group can conduct hands-on workshops, whiteboarding sessions to talk about particular use cases within your environment, um, workload assessments to determine if there are existing analytic workloads that may be enhanced, um, customer value engagements that look at more of the financial aspects of the value proposition, how much you can save by reducing disk storage, how much you can save by reducing ETL software licensing costs, and then finally a proof of concept where we actually install software and load data. So um, let me see. Uh, Ramandap Deep uh, Sahota, I apologize. I am opening your mic right now. You said that you had a question. Why don't you go ahead and, and let folks hear that? I'm assuming that you have a mic and that um, we can hear you on this end. Please go ahead. Ramandeep Sahota, S-A-H-O-T-A. Uh, I had a, a question raised. Oh, I, we had an accidental hand raise. Not a problem. So we're going to clear that. So, Kim, uh, I'm going to let you wrap it up. Um, everybody's been hearing my voice for um, most of the afternoon. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think that was a very that was an excellent presentation. Um, one of the things that's I think very important when we're um, talking to customers about about HTAP and and doing something like this where we're trying to combine some things and and customers are looking at at different ways of doing this. Obviously, there are financial, there are business, there are technical considerations to be considered. And everybody needs to take, um, to understand what's going on, obviously, from a high level. And I hope that's what this presentation has delivered. But as Frank said, the next step is always doing that deeper dive and going in and taking a look at what your business SLAs are. What are you really trying to do with the analytics? Have you um, worked really, really hard to develop a whole analytics platform within your company that is very rarely used? Um, we've worked with a couple customers that have um, um, put a lot of effort into um, building out analytics platforms and then they find out that the business analysts that um, said they needed them so desperately never touched them. Um, Everything costs a lot of money and all this stuff takes a lot of work. And 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 obviously, even though we're trying to do some of this to um, reduce complexity, at the same time, 
it's new and therefore for anyone's IT organization, there will be some complexity simply because you're gonna have a new project. So um, basically what I'd like to do is invite all the folks that have been on the call, thank you for your patience, but if you have any questions and if there's any way that we can help you begin that analysis and uh, begin to get questions answered that would allow you to evaluate what the value, uh, you know, what is HTAP going to mean for your organization? And is this something you should be um, learning more about and getting prepared for? Let us know how we can help. Um, we really appreciate it, and thanks for your time. Thank you, Kim. Great job. So um, thank you. Uh, let me add my thanks to Kim's. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this, The materials and the uh, recording of the webinar will be on the Fillmore Group's blog within the next day or so. So if you have colleagues that you think would benefit from it or if you just like to have the slides, uh, that's where they will be. Take care and have a great day.